Good afternoon. This is Carrie Hatt, Managing Editor of Advanced for Administrators of the Laboratory. Welcome to the webinar, Maldetoff and Today's Clinical Microbiology Lab, Patient Care and Perspective. Today's webinar is being presented by Dr. Omai Garner and sponsored by VU Mariu. Dr. Garner is the Assistant Clinical Professor in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at UCLA and serves as the Associate Director of Clinical Microbiology for the UCLA Health System. He's leading the implementation of Myla and Vitec MS into the Clinical Microbiology Lab at UCLA. Thanks again for joining us for today's webinar. At this point, I'll turn the presentation over to our speaker. Good morning, everybody. So um, I want to thank BMRU for hosting this educational lecture today. And today's talk is going to be Maldi Toff in today's Clinical Microbiology Laboratory, Patient Care and Perspective. And really the focus of this talk is the impact that Maldi Toff can have not only on patient care and turnaround time, but also the impact it can have in workflow within a clinical microbiology laboratory. Uh, we do have three learning objectives for today's talk. So at the finish of the talk, you should be able to describe the technology behind Maldi-Toff organism identification, identify the strengths and weaknesses in implementing Maldi-Toff lab-wide within a clinical microbiology laboratory, and then be able to discuss the specific clinical impact of Maldi-Toff on patient care. So a little bit of a talk outline for today. We're going to begin with a case study, and this is a case directly from UCLA of a uh, complicated anaerobic infection. Then we're going to walk through an introduction to Maldi-Toff. We're going to talk about the evolution of bacterial identification in the clinical laboratory and where Maldi-Toff fits in that, and then specifically the Vitec MS. So we're going to discuss spotting on that instrument, bin matrixing, which is the system that allows for identification on that instrument, and then what the results actually look like coming off of the Vitec MS. We're going to discuss the BMRU clinical trial, and so we're going to talk about the clinical sites and then also the clinical testing that was involved in the trial, and then we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into the data, and so looking specifically at groups of organisms, how good is this specific technology at actually identifying organisms? So we'll start with the aerobic gram-positive organisms, move on to Enterobacteriaceae, talk a little bit about gram-negative non-fermenters. We'll focus in on anaerobes because that's critical to today's case study. And then we'll discuss yeast. And then we're going to go over, actually, the list of all of the FDA-approved organisms on the Vitec MS. Finally, at the end, we're going to return to the case study and talk about turnaround time and then at-the-bench impact of putting Maldi-Toff into the anaerobe bench. And then we'll go over conclusions. So we'll begin with our case study. So we have a 49-year-old female who shows up to the hospital at UCLA with complaints of fever and extreme back pain. Now, her history is complicated. So she was in a motor vehicle accident as a teenager, which was resulted in severe spinal cord injury and lower extremity paralysis. Due to this paralysis, she had a number of other conditions. These included historically bladder cancer, fibromyalgia, chronic pain, anemia, deep vein thrombosis, she had a left side nephrectomy, bowel resection, and she has a stage four decubitus ulcer complicated by osteomyelitis. So this is a complicated case, not only from an infectious disease perspective, but also from a microbiology perspective. So if you look at her previous infections before she showed up for today's, for the fever and extreme back pain, she's had previous hip septic arthritis with MRSA. In addition, she's had previous MRSA bacteremia two times. And then, not surprisingly, because of the stage 4 decubitus ulcer, she has previous infections with Proteus and Enterococcus from the wound site. Now, current testing at this hospital visit revealed an MRI of right hip that showed joint effusion, and then she has elevated sed rate, elevated C-reactive protein, and elevated white blood cells, right, all indicators of infection. And then her large sacral decubitus ulcer was showing significant purulence. And so she had surgery for resection of the right hip, including a washout, and then she also had ulcer debridement. So I think when you're looking at this case or a case that's as complicated, you can come up with a list of expectations for pathogens. And of course, number one on that list would be MRSA, because she's previously had MRSA in the hip, and then she's also had previous MRSA bacteremia infections. 
And then, of course, we're going to consider the organisms that may come from that stage four decubitus ulcer. And so you're thinking of fecal organisms. And so Enterococcus or potentially gram-negative aerobic bacteria included in Enterobacteriaceae. The results in the laboratory, her blood cultures remained negative, her urine culture was negative, and the wound culture, which was the decubitus ulcer, grew multiple aerobic gram-negative rods. Now, her bone biopsy of the hip ended up being negative for bacteria, fungus, and AFB, and the aspiration of the hip was actually negative for aerobic bacteria, fungus, and AFB. I will say from this particular patient that we did receive good specimens into the laboratory, right? We didn't get a swab of the decubitus ulcer area growing a lot of organisms that may not be as relevant as a pathogen. And we got surgical resection or surgical material from that hip aspirate. And so five days after submission, as a microbiology lab, we were able to grow anaerobic gram-positive coxy. It was fine Goldia magna. This is a significant pathogen in that area. But because of the expectations previously for pathogens, there's the potential in this case for inadequate antimicrobial coverage, right? There may not have been anaerobe coverage, or specifically, Fingolnia magna can actually be resistant to something like clindamycin, which could be treated for MRSA. So we have the potential for inadequate antimicrobial coverage. So the question I think we ask, especially in relation to Maldi-Toff, is can we do better as a clinical microbiology lab for this specific patient? Can we decrease the turnaround time so that maybe decrease the um, amount of time someone could be on inappropriate coverage? Now, looking at the data, the data is significant in that there is a high clinical impact for delays in organism identification and sensitivity results. And so the example shown here, uh, for acinetobacter bloodstream infections, you can see that on appropriate versus inappropriate treatment, the, survivor, the survivability curve decreases dramatically on inappropriate treatment. And even after five days, so if you kind of trace up five days here, you can even see in that short window of time, the survivability of being on appropriate treatment sits around 80% but it drops down to kind of the high 60% range if you're not on appropriate coverage. This also comes into play for the amount of time a patient spends in the hospital. So if you look at some data collected for skin and soft tissue infections, you see that either with infection with MRSA or a healthcare-associated infection, your mean length of stay in the hospital is going to be longer if you are on inappropriate versus being on appropriate coverage. So not only does appropriate coverage affect mortality, but it also affects the amount of time in the hospital. And we all know that the amount of time correlated in the hospital leads to an increase in healthcare associated infections and a large expense for the hospital. But let's do a, a bit deeper of a dive as to why it took us in the microbiology lab five days to identify, identify Feingoldia magna. And this is going to get into more specifics of the anaerobe bench. And so at time zero, the specimen arrived to our lab. This was a hip aspirate specimen and it was plated on anaerobic-specific plates, so brucella blood agar and then selective plates. Now, anaerobes grow much slower than aerobic organisms, so in anaerobic bacteriology, after setting the plates, we leave them for 48 hours. We don't open them, we don't look at them to allow appropriate growth of anaerobes. After 48 hours, the plates are open, and what we saw in this instance was moderate growth of a single colony type. That single colony type was a gram-positive coxy. Now, at this point, we don't know whether or not that's an aerobe or an anaerobe. Other gram-positive coxi, including coagulus negative staph or staph aureus, these organisms are facultative anaerobes, and so they can grow anaerobically. And so you can be fooled at this point. So at this point in the classic anaerobic bacteriology, we run a test called the aerotolerance test. And with the aerotolerance test, you're asking whether the organism initially isolated can grow in the presence of oxygen. And so you take that organism, you plate it out on blood agar plates and chocolate plates, and you incubate it aerobically. You wait another two days, and then you open that plate up. When you open that plate up after two days, if the organism is growing aerobically, then it was a facultative anaerobe, and you can move it back into the aerobic bacteriology bench for identification. But if it, there's no growth on the aerotolerance plates, that means you actually have a relevant anaerobe growing on those plates. So after 120 hours, the plates are checked for aerobic growth. Now, this is more than two days, 
And the reason this is more than two days is because due to the current staffing crisis that we're seeing on, among technologists in clinical microbiology laboratories, oftentimes anaerobic bacteriology can't be offered seven days a week, or in some laboratories it's not offered at all. And so because, let's say hypothetically, this play came up on Sunday and we weren't doing anaerobic bacteriology on Sunday, that would cause a delay in an additional day. So at 120 hours, there was no growth aerobically on the aerotolerance test, but we were able to identify by rapid ana, which is a biochemical test, Feingoldia magna. Then additionally, after two more days, sensitivities were finalized on that isolate. This is very important for an organism like Fangoldia magna because it can be resisted. And so looking over the total time, what we see is the total time for identification was five days, and then the total time for identification and sensitivities was actually seven days. And so you have potentially a very long time for someone to be on inappropriate therapy. And so the question we want to answer today is, can we use MALDI-TOF to do better as a microbiology lab for this specific patient. And so at this point, I kind of want to back up and talk about how we do identification in the bacteriology laboratory. And so our initial look for identification is by morphology. And a lot of information can be gleaned for morphology, but that information isn't very specific. So for example, I show here gram-positive cocci, gram-negative rods. This gram-positive cocci, even as we talked about in the case we looked at, it could be coagulase negative staph, it could be staphylococcus aureus, it could even potentially be Feingoldia magna or some other gram-positive cocci. Gram-negative rods, this could be something like E. coli or it could be something like acinetobacter. So you don't get a high level of specificity, but you have a very rapid turnaround time for this particular morphology test. Also, you can kind of look at how it's growing on the plates, right? And so whether or not um, colony size, colony color, whether or not there's any lysis of the red blood cells also give you an idea as to what the organism is, but it's not going to specifically tell you. So our advantages here are rapid turnaround time and very low cost. The disadvantages are low specificity. The next stage in the evolution of microbial identification was biochemical identification. And this immediately started with conventional tube tests. And so these conventional tube tests ask whether a bacteria can use an enzyme to convert one substance into another. Typically, these tests, these tests last from 46 hours to overnight, but it adds layers of specificity. So now that you can take the gram stain and then differentiate out, let's say, members of the class Menorobacteriaceae. Now, there are also rapid biochemical tests shown here, and these are tests that happen immediately, kind of like an oxidase test that will say something enzymatically about the organism to add to the specificity profile that you're seeing from the biochemical tube test. Now, these systems typically take days and have a very long turnaround time, and so companies have begun to, have begun to automate these systems and miniaturize them. And so the API strip, you could imagine, is just a miniaturized biochemical identification scheme for organisms. And then, as represented by the Vitec or the Vitec 2, companies went a further step to automate these systems, but essentially it's still biochemical identification. So here you see a Vitec card, very miniaturized, that can be run on a higher throughput machine. And so your advantages here are you've increased specificity, right, compared to morphology, but you've decreased or you've increased the turnaround time. And so the amount of time it takes to identify is still going to be longer than it would from a morphology standpoint. And then, of course, you've exponentially increased the cost in doing this. Now, nucleic acid analysis has kind of taken over as being the gold standard for specificity in identifying an organism. And this includes either PCR or sequencing. And this is identifying areas in the nucleic acid sequence, typically DNA, that are specific to an organism, allowing almost 100% identification of that organism. PCR itself is an amplification process, and so you can take a small amount of DNA, amplify it into a large amount, and identify. This also allows us in microbiology to identify organisms without relying on culture. And so you can actually do an identification direct from a specimen, but of course when you're considering bacteria, a lot of our specimens include commensal organisms. So it's not quite as helpful in that instance, but in a sterile fluid 
or something where you're only seeing a single organism, this amplification can be used. It has a very, very high specificity. Now, the disadvantages of this particular system are, A, increased turnaround time. And so PCR combined with nucleic acid sequencing takes a couple of days. It's also very, in high, very high intensity to perform on the workbench. And so combining those two things together usually leads to batching. So you're only doing this two or three times a week. And so if you're a very high throughput laboratory setting, you can't afford to take this much time per identification per bug. It's also an extremely high cost. And so the enzymes, the DNA polymerase type enzymes that are involved in PCR amplification, and everything that goes into sequencing ends up being very expensive. And so your cost per test ends up being very, very high. So finally, we're going to talk about Molitov. And so uh, up to this point, you can see what we've been really doing is a comparison set. And so you have a set of either biochemical or sequencing data, and you're going to compare that to a library, and it's going to give you an identification of the organism. So you use the same thing in Molitov, but in Molitov, what we're looking at is protein spectra. So here you see I have an example protein spectra. We're going to get into the details of this technology. But the advantages of this system is that it offers a very high specificity. In fact, it offers a specificity that seems to rival nucleic acid analysis, which is as good as we can get. This actually decreases the turnaround time, and so as compared to sequencing or biochemical results, because it ends up being a much faster process. In addition, it's pretty low cost. And it's pretty low cost because it's pretty low reagent. The disadvantages of this particular system, though, are it does have an immediate high capital cost, but that you can easily make a justification for return on that high capital cost. So let's talk more specifically about the technology. And so MALDI-TOF stands for Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization Time of Flight. So what we're going to do is we're going to break that into component parts to understand this technology. And so what happens is you take cultured bacteria. Remember, this is not an amplification method. Right? This is not a direct from sample method. You have to have a lot of the organism isolated to be able to use Malditoff. You take that sample and you, you take that and you run it onto, you plate it onto the sample well. And then in that sample well, you're going to overlay matrix. And the goal of that matrix, that matrix is going to break down the cell walls that are there on that bacteria and make the proteins available for analysis. In addition, it's going to ionize. And so it's going to add ions to the proteins. The next step is laser. And so a laser is going to come down and desorb the material off of the well. Now, this is, Molitoff is soft laser ionization. And typical mass spec analysis it's called hard laser, and the reason why is because the laser is so strong that it actually breaks down proteins, carbohydrates, whatever it is you're now analyzing into their molecular components, and then you're able to analyze their molecular components. In this instance, with Molitoff, because it's soft laser ionization, it's not quite as extreme of a breakdown, and so what can be analyzed are full proteins or even protein complexes. And so after the laser hit, you get a desorption, and so these vaporized, positively charged cloud of samples and proteins and matrix, it lifts off of that sample surface, and then it enters the electrostatic field, and then this is where the time of flight mass analyzer is. And so that's shown here on the left and on the right picture. And so specifically what happens, we're going to do, to understand this, I think the best way is to do a little bit of a thought experiment. And so for here, we've taken bacteria and we've placed them on the sample matrix over here. And we're going to imagine that our analyzed bacteria is made up of three component parts, green, red, and blue. And so we have green, red, and blue. And as the laser hits, these protein complexes, they desorb, they move into the vacuum chamber, and they head towards the detector. Now, as they move through that chamber, they're going to move in relation to their mass and their charge. The smaller particles are going to move the fastest through the electrostatic tube and hit the detector first, where the larger particles are going to move slower and hit the detector later. So here, 
you see looking at this graph of intensity versus time of flight, our smallest particles were our green particles. They hit first, and so you see a peak of green. The next size particles are red, and then the next size particles are blue. And so what you see is we have a good separation of proteins based through the TOF analyzer. In addition, not only do you get separating, separation by mass and charge, but you also get an intensity peak. And that intensity peak is going to be in relation to how much protein is actually there. And so you see in our thought experiment bacteria made up of green, red, and blue proteins, the red protein is most specific. The red protein is highest in abundance there, whereas the blue protein, which is larger, is a little bit less. The green protein is a little bit less. And so you can kind of relate that to the Maldi-Toff spectra that's seen on the bottom and imagine that all of these component parts are different proteins at different intensities and different sizes. And the beauty of this system is that that's going to relate specifically to a single type of organism. Now, I think the question comes up immediately, at least it did in my mind, which proteins are actually being analyzed. And so the data has actually been known in this since the 80s. It looks like if you look at the spectra, and the spectra is going to be a direct relation to kilodaltons because usually the charge is one, and so that mass over charge ratio is really just going to equal the mass. And so if you look to see what flies in the spectra, you see in the very, very small region, that region between zero and two kilodaltons, you really have matrix and just metabolites in there. And then between two and 20 kilodaltons, what you see are structural proteins, structural proteins and polymers. Above 20 kilodaltons, in that 20 to 100 kilodalton range, you have enzymes and enzyme complexes. Now, what's interesting for microbial identification from all the top, we're just going to zero in on that area of structural proteins. The reason why we're able to do this is because that is the area that gives distinctive peaks that are species-specific. If you look at the enzymes and the enzyme complexes, one downfall of that is, let's say you're growing your organism on selective media. Right? So if something's growing on McConkie, it's going to need to make enzymes to be able to survive the bile salts that are in that media. And so you would see dis distinctly different profiles if you're looking between 20 and 100 based on the media that's growing on. The structural proteins themselves are not as subject to changes in environmental challenges. And so looking here, the key to maldi toff species identification is that different species lead to very specifically different patterns. And so here you see the MALDI profile, the MALDI profile for strep pneumo, the MALDI profile for E. coli, and the MALDI profile for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So you'd imagine if you had a library of these profiles, you could take your unknown profile, compare it, and then pull out which one it compares directly to. A lot of times the questions come up, like for strep pneumo, well, so what is that protein that's out L297988? And for clinical diagnostic use, it isn't as important to know what that specific protein is. The question we ask is, is the profile itself specific enough for us to pull out something like Streptococcus pneumoniae? One of the other keys to this system is that there are conserved peak patterns found within the species. And so if you run five or six staph aureus, or if you run five or six coagulase negative staph, which in the clinical lab, these are similar organisms. But from a specificity standpoint, from MALDI, you can see by the peak changes that they look distinctly different between the two species. But within a species, they look very similar, which allows you to have a reliability in your identification scheme. So looking very specifically then at the Vitec MS, let's talk about how this mass spec works. So the workflow is a colony gets picked. And you remember, to run Maldi talk, you have to have an isolated colony, right? Because if you have a colony laid on top of another colony, that's going to dramatically affect your protein profile peaks. And so in knowing you have an isolated colony, you can pick that colony, smear that onto the target slide, and then add matrix itself, if it's a bacteria, or if it's a yeast, yeast have a, a bit stronger of a cell wall. And that needs to be broken down before the matrix is added. So on the slide, you can actually add formic acid, allow that to break down that yeast cell wall, then come and add the matrix and load it into the analyzer. So taking kind of a closer look at the disposable slides, these are barcoded. And so this adds to the ease 
of workflow within a laboratory. And there are three acquisition groups per slide, and you can actually run 16 samples per group. And you run a calibrator spot. That middle spot, the blue with the red around it, that's a calibrator spot that allows the machine to calibrate and say, over the course of this 16, it's working. The spot's working. We're getting the peaks that we need to get. And it'll check that calibrator before, and then it'll check that calibrator again after as a nice control for the laser as it's moving through. But then you can use the Vitec prep station. And this prep station, after you have your isolate, is where you go ahead and you load your isolate and your isolate information onto the slide. So you can scan the target slide, additionally scan the lab ID on the plate. This is going to connect those two pieces of information. And then you can deposit your spots one at a time. After you're finishing depositing the slots, you can send the slide then over to the acquisition station where it's going to be run. At this same screen, you're also able to connect specifically to the information going to the Vitec 2 in case you were going to run AST on that particular organism as well. So the acquisition station is where actually the identification occurs. And so the door gets opened to the machine, and you can scan your slide in. As you've scanned your slide in, the information that you loaded onto the prep station is going to show up on the acquisition station. You can see the number of organisms that were spotted, and then you're going to go ahead and load the slides. Once the slides are loaded, the machine is going to attempt to acquire 100 different spectral acquisition spots from a single spot. And so here you can see the red is your MALDI being acquired. And there's going to be 100 different acquisition points for it to call, to, for it to call it green, for it to say it's acquired enough spectral information to go ahead and move and try and get an identification. And so it's going to go through, and it does this fairly rapidly, I would say. Once it starts, you're between 30 and 45 seconds per slide, per spot, to be able to identify, um, to get enough peaks to identify an organism. And it's going to run through everything. And what's nice about this particular machine, I feel, is it's very high throughput. right? So you're able to batch four completely different slides onto this and run them all at the same time. So at this point, we're going to move on to results review. So the question then is, what comes up? after this process occurs. And so there's really three different levels of results that can appear on the Vitec MS. The first is your high level quality results. So this is your green square. And this is going to mean you have a perfect quality control. You have one choice if it's been a single deposit or if you do duplicates. And clinically in a laboratory, we've really pushed for duplication of specimens just as an additional control. The machine will understand that these are duplicate results, and they should be exactly the same. And so those same results will show up. It'll be green if those results are exactly the same. Now here you see under the second one down, Staph aureus, 99.9% .9 confidence. The confidence level is green, or Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now we can also give a medium quality results. This means that the quality control worked, but there's a low discrimination if it's a single deposit. So the spectra that was produced on the MALDI doesn't compare high enough to a single spectra, so it's going to give multiple choices on that spectra. The third kind of result that can come off is a low quality result. And in a low quality result, either the acquisition failed, and so you weren't going back here, able to actually acquire 100 peaks to be able to get enough peaks for analysis, or simply that the peaks that were acquired don't match anything in the database. And I think that you know, in, in a hospital setting where an immunocompromised patient happens to be a very commonplace thing, you can see these organisms coming up causing no identifications on the MALDI because they're environmental bugs that we never really even considered to be pathogens. So it's interesting to step back and look at how the machine specifically goes about identifying organisms. And so the key to the MALDI, of course, is the laser and building all the spectra. But you need to have something to compare it to that is very robust. And so really, the building of the database is one of the key components to MALDI TOF identification. And so for the Vitec MS, the uh, in vitro diagnostic version, they took 13,000 isolates, which is about 29,000 spectra. And per species, to be able to make a solid identification, on average, they took about 18 isolates. And so you don't want to get trapped and think that 
a staph aureus found in New York City is going to have the exact same spectral profile as a staph aureus found in Los Angeles. So the robustness of the database depends on you taking organisms and building your database from a wide variety. And so here you'll see that for the spectra, for the organisms that are very common, something like Staph aureus, E. coli, Canada albicans, Strep pneumo, you see that the number of spectra per species in order to build the database was actually up in the hundreds. So looking specifically at what comes off of the machine, the machine will, will produce a raw spectra. And then once that raw spectra is produced, there's a denoising. And so you, you can see you have a lot of very, very small blips showing up that aren't key to organism identification. So they'll do a baseline subtraction. And then there will be a peak detection algorithm. What this does is it figures out in the course of these peaks showing in the process spectrum which peaks are relevant in there. And it'll pull those peaks out just for analysis. So it's, it's simplifying the noise to identify what the species is. And then it moves on to this process of adaptive binning. I think up to this point, I've, I've been couching the Maldi top as something that is a comparison, right? You take your spectra and you compare it to the library, but it's actually a bit more complicated than that, which allows added specificity. And so what Vitek has done, what BMRU has done, is they have taken this entire spectra and divided it up into 1,300 bins. And in each bin, they want to ask a specific question, is this bin related to Staph aureus or not? So the way that they do that is here you see two Staph aureuses, a Staph epidermidis, a Citrobacter fundii, and they're asking in each bin, what is the weight or score or likelihood that you have a peak there? And that peak is specific for Staphylococcus aureus. So if you look at bin one, in bin one you see a peak for Staph aureus, a peak for both of the Staph aureuses, but you see a peak for Staph epi and a peak for Citrobacter fundii. So this seems to be a peak that would show up for most aerobic organisms. So its score is a zero. So as far as specificity is concerned, it's not specific to Staph aureus. Then they move on to bin two, and remember they do this for 1,300 bins. In bin two, you see a large peak for the first Staph aureus, a large peak for the second Staph aureus, but no peak for Staph epi, no peak for Citrobacter fundii. So this gets a score of a plus 20. Moving on, bin 3, no peaks for anything. That's a zero. Bin 4, you see that there are no peaks for Staph aureus, but there are substantial peaks for Staph epi and for Citrobacter. So this gets a negative score. So then they go ahead and they composite all of these scores together in a mathematical algorithm to be able to determine the specificity. You know, this kind of analysis, I think, allows for the distinction between organisms that are very close in their spectral peaks, something like uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae and the Viridens group strep, you're able to pull out the differences by doing this bin matrixing. And so here, for a result computation, you do a comparison to identify the bin matrix. Computing will produce bin weights for all the species. This gives you a score. They will convert that bin weight score to confidence value and then deliver the identification of results. And so now you've kind of seen the background of MALDI and understand the science and how it does identification. Let's look specifically at the clinical trial. Well, how did this technology get through the FDA? And so there were five clinical trial sites. About 7,000 results were tested from about 4,600 bugs. About 3,700 of those were fresh isolates from the individual collection sites. And then there was proficiency and reproducibility testing for a number of ATCC strains. The calibrator was always an E. coli strain. Positive controls were the one of these organisms above. And then the negative control was just matrix alone. Because with matrix alone, you shouldn't see any protein spectra. So the five sites um, matched, I think, the robust robustness of the database. And so when we were talking about, does a staph aureus look the same from New York as it does from Los Angeles, this was something that was tested within the clinical trial. And so the collaborators on the clinical trial were UCLA Health System, uh, Barnes-Jewish in St. Louis, Cleveland Clinic, North Shore LIJ, and Massachusetts General. Every single collection site and analysis site treated the organisms exactly the same. We all grew them on the same media. We They're either aerobic, anaerobic, or yeast. We targeted them on the slide in the same way, and then all of the isolates were compared to sequences. 
the sequencing happens to be the gold standard for specificity for aerobic, anaerobic, and yeast identification. So let's get a little bit into the data. And so I pulled out kind of the common pathogens or the pathogens of interest in each group. So looking at gram-positive aerobic bacteria, out of 463 tested isolates, 95% were correct to species. An additional 4% were correct to genus. The correct to genus, the correct to species distinction, I think, is interesting. In aerobic gram-positive bacteria, correct to genus isn't that informative. If we clinically tell our physicians that they have staphylococcus, that doesn't inform anything for a pathogen or streptococcus in general. So for gram-positive aerobic bacteria, it's very important to be correct to species. Now, looking at Enterobacteriaceae, or gram-negative aerobic bacteria, what we see is the correct to species number was also very high, 95% correct to genus was an additional 4%, and in pulling out some of our known opportunistic pathogens out of this group, you can see the identification numbers were very high. Focusing in on Citrobacter, though, Citrobacter only showed a 65% correct to species, but an additional 27% were correct to genus. And I think it's important within a clinical laboratory that you can give a physician Citrobacter as a genus along with susceptibility, and that is information that is critical for that physician, as well as opposed to calling it Citrobacter frundii specifically may not hold as much clinical weight. I think the same thing was seen in the data for the gram-negative non-enterobacteriaceae, which mainly, cons mainly consists of our pathogenic non-fermenters and some fastidious organisms. You can see for these organisms, the corrected species number was actually lower. So it was 84%, but then an additional 5% was corrected genus. And again, it's critical from a infection standpoint for me to be able to identify the difference between Escherichia coli and Acinetobacter. But it's maybe not as critical to identify the specific species of Acinetobacter, and I think that comes into play here. Looking at anaerobes, uh, the anaerobe data, data came out very positive, and so this rivals what we even see for sequencing, that it's above 90% correct to species identification, especially for the anaerobes to be consider most as pathogens or opportunistic pathogens within a laboratory setting, including BFRAG, Clostridium perfringens, and the Fusobacterium. And here you see Feingoldia magna, the isolate that we identified in our lab for our case study today, up around 95%. The data for yeast was exceptionally strong, and so it was up above 97 98%. And so this was a really strong identification scheme for yeast. You can see that the can I pulled out the Canadas that are clinically relevant or most clinically relevant, including Canada albicans, and then Glabrata, Glabrata and Cruziari are Canada that um, typically can be fluconazole resistant. And then even some organisms that are difficult, like Malassezia furfur, and organisms where you really need complicated culture techniques, including an oil overlay to be able to grow, the Molitoff does a very good job of recognizing those organisms. So looking at the FDA clinical trial as a whole, what we see that is correct to species, we're talking around 88, 90%. Correct to genus was additional 6.2%. So with a total correct 94% identification. Now, I think it's important to look at what were those other 6%. It's distinctly different if they're no ID versus missed identification. No identification, I think, is something in a clinical lab you can work with, right? I think we're used to, in bacteriology identification, getting something like a no identification. So it doesn't match enough on the API strip, or the Vitec 2 can't tell specifically what it is. Or even with sequencing, it doesn't know specifically what bug it is. Whereas missed IDs, I think, can be dangerous, right? The identification of a strep pneumo as a viridens group strep is something that is exceptionally clinically relevant. And so what I liked in the, our particular FDA clinical trial for this technology is that the total number of missed IDs was actually below 1%. And so this was submitted to the FDA in December 2012 and was accepted in August 2013. So I think it's informative for us to spend a couple of slides just looking at the FDA approved list. So what lists of organisms are FDA approved on the Vitec MS? And so I've listed them. For aerobic gram-positive bacteria, there are 14 genus and 47 species. And what I've done is I've starred different species that I think are most clinically relevant. I mean, I skipped Carinibacterium jkm, but that is a very important
organism to be able to correctly identify, especially in the context of all the rest of the cryonibacterium. Enterococcus, Listeria, Staph aureus, the Staph lutinensis, and Staph saprophyticus, these coagulase negative sorts of staph that are pathogenically relevant, and then also uh, the Streptococcus group. Moving on for the aerobic gram negative bacteria, we have 45 genus and 68 species. You see this list is long and it includes non-fermenters, Enterobacteriaceae, and even some of the organisms that uh, we consider to be difficult to identify, or at least it takes a large amount of different culture manipulations to identify, such as the Haemophilus, right, like Haemophilus influenza versus Parahemolyticus or Parainfluenza. Looking at the isolates for anaerobes, the FDA-approved isolates, there's 11 genus and 26 species. This list um, is comprehensive, but definitely has some holes in it, and so there needs to be some additions to this particular list, like the Clostridium list uh, is missing Clostridium septicum, but for the most part, because of the advantages you see in time and turnaround time for anaerobic bacteria, this list is a great list. And then yeast, and I really think um, the FDA-approved list on yeast is, is pretty much complete. And so if you look at the eight genus and 30 species that are here, anything that you could want to be here outside of potentially Cryptococcus gadii for us on the West Coast is specific on this list and uh, is FDA approved. So I think at this point, we've described the technology, we know how the technology works. Let's return to our case study and see what role Maldi-Toff could have played with this identification of Feingoldia magna. So just as a review, it took us somewhere in the range of 120 to 168 hours post receiving the specimen for a uh, identification and complete sensitivities. This allows for a five day to seven day window potentially where the patient could be on inappropriate coverage. So let's now put Maldi in this equation and see what would have happened. So time zero hour the specimen arrives, it gets plated normally on a Brucella blood agar and selective plates and incubated anaerobically. We can't dramatically affect those first two days. Remember, none of this technology makes anaerobes grow any faster, right? Well, all we're doing is asking, can we identify, and at what point can we identify? So we're still going to leave the plates for 48 hours. But at that point, when the plates are opened, and you have moderate growth of a single colony type, this is perfect for Maldi. Maldi is able to replace your arrow tolerance test here, right? Because Maldi can differentiate between gram-positive coxie, that's Feingoldia magna, and gram-positive coxie, let's say, is that a staphylococcus. And so in being able to do that, what you see is that you cut down your total time for identification or your potential time on inappropriate therapy to two days. And that two days can have a dramatic result. It has an actual large clinical impact, right? We've saved three days for the patient overall for identification and sensitivities. But also here, I think we can highlight the lab impact. And so anaerobic bacteriology is an intensive bench, right? You're in and out of the anaerobe chamber. If you're out of the anaerobe chamber for too long with certain organisms, those organisms die. It's a stressful bench. It's a bench that involves a, a lot of technologist time. And so hopefully Maldi-Toff itself, because the identification is so rapid, you can save CLS time on the bench. You don't have to do an aero tolerance test. An aero tolerance test itself is something that's very time consuming. The plates have to be checked. And then you also don't have to do the biochemical tests that for anaerobes specifically end up having a pretty low specificity for getting the organism. So, you know, something like rabbit ana for certain types of anaerobes are good, but for other types of anaerobes are actually very bad. And so you're able to replace all of that with Maldi. Now, in doing that, because you've saved so much time on the bench, you may actually be able to offer anaerobic coverage seven days a week. And so in our case here, that extra day that we lost because the anaerobic bench wasn't being worked on on Sunday, now it can be worked on on Sunday because Molitoff has worked its way into the laboratory. So I think that the evidence is clear that Molitoff can help, but we've shown an example that may not represent realistically what comes into the anaerobic bench in the laboratory. And so we showed an example like this plate I have here with one to three well-isolated colony types. Did you get a clean specimen in the laboratory? The challenge of anaerobic bacteriology is that anaerobes make up a large percentage of your commensal flora. 
be it either orally, gastrointestinally, or on the skin, there's a lot of anaerobes there. So if the specimen comes in, and like in our case, the specimen was a surgery specimen, so that specimen should be clean. But a lot of times, you don't get surgery specimens in for anaerobes. And so when incorporating Molitoff into your laboratory, especially the anaerobic bench, here it has an obvious clinical impact. But I think we can ask a more sophisticated question about anaerobes in MALDI. So let's say this type of plate comes in. This type of plate I think is more common, and we call it here mixed with no predominance. So what we see in these black circles are multiple organism types, not isolated away. Some of them are very close or right on top of each other. And because anaerobes can, even a single anaerobe can produce an array of colony types, you're not quite sure in pulling for MALDI whether these are isolated different organisms. And so it's hard to take this and then just go ahead and run MALDI specifically on each organism. Also, you have to understand for MALDI is that once you use that spot, it's gone, right? So if you don't have another representative organism there, you're not going to be able to go ahead and do sensitivities. You're not going to have a purity plate. So you don't end up saving time just incorporating MALDI right away. And then in addition, we even see this within the anaerobic bacteriology laboratory. Potentially, it's a specimen that should have been rejected, but you see growth of a large number of organisms. And so MALDI really doesn't work in this particular setting because you don't have isolated organisms that you can identify. And so when you're bringing MALDI TOF into a laboratory, I think it's important to look very specifically at your SOPs and determine where MALDI TOF can be most effectively interlaced to save workflow and to save work time and decrease turnaround time. So in that vein, I kind of have a complicated slide that can represent specifically how you can incorporate MALDI into your laboratory setting. And so looking at the box at the very top, you have a 48-hour initial incubation. As we spoke about before, MALDI isn't going to replace that. But then coming down this central corridor, what we see is we have one to three predominant well-isolated large colonies. Let's say this is our hip aspirate. And so we're going to grow Feingoldia magna from here. It's not complicated by a bunch of other flora. So you can do the gram stain, which we did, gram positive coxy. And then you can do MALDI. And so in doing the MALDI, you don't have to do um, the aero tolerance test. If the MALDI works and it's an FDA-approved organism, we're going to go ahead and release a definitive ID at that point. If the MALDI works, but it's a non-FDA-approved organism, and we didn't really talk about this distinction in our laboratory, if it's a non-FDA-approved organism, you're going to need to do some kind of additional testing. Perhaps at that point, you release a descriptive ID, or at that point, your additional testing allows you to release a definitive ID. And you really have to look at how your own hospital is using anaerobic information to make that distinction. Now, if MALDI doesn't work, so let's say you get no identification or a very low quality result in identification, then you can go back and do the aero tolerance test, right? So it's not that Maldi TOF is replacing all of the classic tests. It's just you need to work it into your workflow so that you know when to use those tests and when not to use those tests. Then at that point, the aero tolerance test is run, and you can even repeat Maldi. So repeat Maldi on whatever isolates that happen to come out of that. Now, following the course over here for greater than three predominant mix, you can have isolated counties in that, and you can run MALDI. You can have no isolated counties. So I think that this just gives you a very good example of how laboratories should approach MALDI TOF. It's hard to take a new technology and just put it into the laboratory and kind of have it as a free-for-all and say, all right, we have MALDI now. Use it. I think that MALDI, MALDI allows us as clinical microbiology laboratories to maybe look at SOPs and protocols that we haven't looked at in a very long time, right? Something like the anaerobic bench. The anaerobic bench has been worked the same way for a very long time. And so this allows you to revisit that protocol, put MALDI in where MALDI works at its most highest impact, and then use that MALDI to decrease turnaround time but also decrease workflow on your benches. So I think the question comes up then, what, what's the order? What's the sequence, then, for bringing MALDI TOF in the laboratory? And this is kind of how we're doing that. When we thought about bringing MALDI into our laboratory at UCLA, we really wanted to maximize clinical impact and improvements to workflow. And so our coordinated plan began with the anaerobe bench, because the anaerobe bench is a bench that 
you can save multiple days for the patient for identification, and you can have a very large impact on workflow on that bench. The next bench we tackled is the yeast bench. So the yeast bench is another bench that sometimes identifications can take a very, very long time, and sometimes they're done based on morphology. And we even saw with earlier slides today, morphology doesn't often offer the high specificity that other sorts of identification schemes than all can offer. So we're going to bring on the yeast bench, or we, are, we have brought on the yeast bench, and we'll have Maldi-Toff replace sort of the classic tests like germ tube, rapid triolose, at the same time keeping those tests around as a backup, because we're always going to run into organisms that the Maldi-Toff may not identify, also, you always want to have in plan in place if your multi goes down, right? So if you have to have a downtime set up, you don't want to get rid of all of the rest of your biochemicals, then you don't have the ability to identify. The other benches we really wanted to bring on board was the blood bench. This can lead to dramatic improvements in turnaround time for ID of cultured organisms isolated from a positive blood culture bottle. The criticals bench. And so any sort of organism found in CSF joint fluid or sterile site specimen, the, the rapid identification of those organisms, even if you can cut down your turnaround time for information by hours, that can make a very large clinical impact. And then finally, we wanted to bring on the large-scale benches, which I think is a, a bit of a challenge as far as Molotov is concerned, because then you have to really think about how the people are going, how you're clinical microbiology technologists are going to use MALDI in the most effective way so it doesn't become a bottleneck, right, because it's a single instrument. And so stool in the night shift and then the miscellaneous in urine benches and then finally being able to take your identifications and connect them over to the Vitec 2 for AST results. So in conclusion for today's talk, uh, we've seen that maldi toff identification of bacteria and yeast represents a low reagent cost high specificity, reduced turnaround time method. You're really capturing kind of the high specificity of nucleic acid amplification and the very, very low cost of morphology identification and combining them together for a high throughput system. The clinical trial that we analyzed showed a high level of species identification uh, and accuracy for multiple clinically relevant species. I think this is important, especially for trust in a laboratory setting, right? you have to be able to trust the results that are coming off of the system. And something like FDA approval allows you to trust those results for identification. Now, that doesn't mean that you can use them blindly in coming off, but it does mean that it has a high level of trust. Uh, integrating the molly and the anaerobic bench can have a dramatic effect on patient care, which I think we saw specifically for the patient we talked about today, and also can save valuable bench time. You may be able to offer anaerobe seven days a week as a laboratory, you may even consider bringing anaerobic bacteriology back into your laboratory if you're a laboratory that happens to be sending that out. It's critical to develop a well-thought-out plan for MALDI. I think the smooth incorporation of maldi toff into a laboratory setting requires this plan. You know, it allows for the savings in workflow to be realized immediately because I think you're definitely going to see a decrease in turnaround time for your patients if you just put MALDI in, but then you may not see that actual on-bench savings. Um, I think I just want to emphasize just as an ending here that this technology does not supersede the expertise of trained microbiologists. None of those numbers that came out of the clinical trial were 100%. There are going to be missed IDs. There are going to be no IDs. And so this is really just another tool in the toolkit for experienced and trained microbiologists to use to be able to direct and help with patient care. And so it, it's faster, and it seems to be as accurate as the best things that we have, but at the same time, it still needs to be well thought out. Gram-staining colony morphology and limited biochemical testing can still be used to identify errors and still needs to be used within a clinical laboratory setting. So that's my talk for today. I want to thank everybody for their time. Uh, just as a quick acknowledgement, I would like to thank the clinical microbiology labs and staff at UCLA, Cleveland Clinic, Mass General, Barnes Jewish Hospital, and North Shore LIJ, and then specifically um, some of the people at those institutions and some people at BMRU.